We will be in Exodus 32, Exodus 32 this morning. So if you want to go ahead and start making your way over there, uh, Exodus 32, and it is Father's Day, um, so this one's just for free. Do you know why fathers always take an extra pair of socks when they go golfing? In case they get a hole in one. Yeah, yeah. There's a... <laughs> There'll be more, there'll be more, uh, the, you know, legally where I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm required to give some dad jokes on Father's Day, just like it was required that we sing Good, Good Father, uh, like it's just something that we have to do now, but, uh, uh, but no, we're going to be in Exodus 32, and the, today the title of the sermon is How to Be a Man of God. And uh, don't worry, ladies, about 95% of everything I say is also going to apply to how to be a a woman of God as well. And so, but we're looking at this story. Um, And uh, one thing that I've always been convicted of, and whenever it is Father's Day or there's a special focus on men, I always still try to leave you encouraged because I know that oftentimes when it comes to men and men talks, uh, we usually get beat up on a a lot. And, And if there's something that I've learned in just pastoring, even the last year especially, it seems, like that there's a lot of men that are just broken and beat down and discouraged and I don't ever want to leave you that way as well but rather encourage you to follow Jesus better I learned that uh, oftentimes we have that habit in church way back when I was a teenager I went to a, a large church and they would have a women's conference one weekend in the year and then the week later they would have the men's conference but in the women's conference they didn't have anybody to run the sound booth and the tech and all of that stuff so they asked like Joel would you mind going and I was like are there young ladies there? But no, um, I, was, uh, I was happy to oblige. And so I was back there running the PowerPoint. And I just remember after they sang their songs, the first lady got up and she was like, ladies, you are beloved. You are beautiful. Like everybody repeat after me, I am beautiful. And like everybody was saying like, I am beautiful. And I'm in the back like, I am beautiful. <laughs> like, right? I was like, this is, this is encouraging. This, is, this makes me feel good, all that. And so then after a week, I went to the men's conference. And uh, during the men's conference, I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be filled up. I'm going to be encouraged and all of this stuff. And that man just got up. And he, I'm pretty sure he's like an old army sergeant. And like he already looked just angry. And he looked out at us. And he's like, men, you are sick dogs. I'm like, what just happened? He's like, I know what you did last night. I was like, what did I do last night, right? And, and oftentimes we, we have this attitude and certainly, certainly we do sometimes as men need to be kind of kicked in the pants and get going here and there might even be some of that today here. But I hope at the end of today you are encouraged to be a better father, to be a better man, to look like Jesus and to be a better woman, to look like Jesus all the more here. And so we're going to be in Exodus 32 starting in verse 1, a very famous passage here here in the book of Exodus. And it says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron. And he said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. And as for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And so all these people now, they are waiting on Moses, waiting on Moses. Now, does anybody remember how long Moses is actually going to spend up on the mountain? 40 days, right? 40 days, 40 nights. That's a common number in the Bible here. But so they are sitting there and just waiting for 40 days. That's it. That's like since May 11th, I think. Uh, May 11th feels like yesterday to me. Like, the way, where does that time go? But yet now they are sitting there for simply just 40 days, and they're like, I don't think, I don't think Moses is coming back. <laughs> like, they could have looked up out the mountain of Mount Sinai, see the smoke and the billowing fire up there, and know that God is still doing something. But yet they say, I, I don't think that Moses is going to come back down. And so they go to Aaron, and they say, up, <laughs> which automatically tells you Aaron was being kind of lazy. Like Moses' boss is out of town, and whenever your boss is out of town, you know, you don't work as hard. And so uh, we put cameras in the office, and I know this to be true. I saw what Devin was doing. And so... <laughs> and so, but he was like, hey, up, up. And so Mo, Aaron's like, okay, fine, I'll do something. And so he says, make us gods. And first off, if you ever have to state that, make us gods, like already that God is pretty worthless. If you have to make the God, then it's not a very good God. And so they say, make us God who can go before. And then so ask for this man, Moses, this Moses guy. And they act like they don't even know him. I'm like, really, really? The, the, like he put his stick in the water and it all turned, you know, 
to blood. There's fire fell down. He went to the Red Sea. It's parted. Like, clearly, you know who this guy is. Don't act like you're like, oh, who's this Moses guy? You know, that guy that was in Egypt. Now, Like, they, they act like he's not that important here. But this is what they go up to Aaron. Now, of course, Aaron, being a godly man, says, no, no, you're ridiculous. Stop saying that. <laughs> Unfortunately not, though, does he? And so, but the very first thing, the very first point in your bulletin is this, is that we need to stand firm when God is silent. How to be a man of God, how to be a woman of God is to stand firm even when God is silent. Because oftentimes we get in situations where we feel like we are just waiting on God to make a move. We are just waiting for God to open up that next door, the, to mend that relationship, to, to make us, help us get to that next step in our faith. And yet we've been waiting and we've been waiting and we've been waiting and it feels like it's never going to come. But a mature person, a man full of God's spirit is going to say, I'm going to stay faithful even when God is silent. I'm going to stay faithful. I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to be a person of prayer. I'm going to be a person of God's word even when he is silent. And that's what they needed to learn because Aaron should have said, absolutely no way, you guys get out of here. You're gonna be in so much trouble when I tell Moses. But here's what he actually says. He says, so Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold. (laughs) That wasn't hard. That are in your ears and your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. Now, notice here, first of all, I like this. It says, take off the rings that are in the ears of the wives the sons and the daughters. Who's missing there? Those guys, right? He's like, take all the jewelry off of everybody else. You guys can get, apparently they were like, you know, Italian mobsters. They're like, don't touch my gold chain. Like, it, it doesn't make sense. But he's like, take off the, all the gold from everybody else in the family and then bring that over to me here. In verse three, it says, so all the people took off their rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from the hand and fashioned it with the graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And so here's what happens. He gathers all of this gold. He throws it in the fire. He melts it down. He starts to engrave some sort of calf here. Um, And first off, though, notice that the very last part of this verse here, it says the word Lord in all capital letters. Now, if you don't know, most of the translations will do this. Whenever it's in all capital letters, it's actually the word Yahweh. It means God's covenantal name. It's something that they understood. And so what was happening here was not necessarily that they were saying, we're no longer going to worship our God anymore, but rather they're saying, we're going to worship God and add in a little bit of the culture. Add in a little bit of the outside influence. Add it in here. And so we get a worship God here, yes. And so they were going to do all of these things, and they were going to have a celebration all for Yahweh. But what is happening, this is so significant then, is they were about ready to bring in this golden calf, and this golden calf was one of the Egyptian gods. And actually, oftentimes, the other gods are pictured up sitting on top of it. So they're probably thinking, oh, Yahweh's going to sit on top of this golden calf, and, and now it'll be even strengthened. He'll be even more powerful. But what was happening here is they were saying, we don't want just God to be on this altar. I I brought this little extra step here just to to symbolize this, the altar here. They said when God should have been the one on the altar, when God should have been the one that was on the throne, here's what they say. Hey, God, can you scoot over a little bit? We're trying to add a little bit of something extra in there. And we do that as well. Because first of all, where did they get all the gold from? Where did they get the gold from? Do you remember? Egypt. Egypt. Yeah, so what happened was, Exodus chapter 20, we talked about it before. Whenever they were about ready to leave Egypt, God says, hey, I'm going to give you favor with all the Egyptians. So you can just knock on your neighbor's door and be like, hey, can we have all your gold and silver and all that? And the Egyptians were going to say, okay, and they give them all of this. And in that way, they plundered the Egyptians, the Bible says. So now God has blessed them with all of this gold, all this silver, all this jewelry, all of of this. So now they are walking out like pirates. They're, they're, They're just going crazy here. And then they get out, and eventually, what was the purpose? of all that, they were supposed to give it back to the Lord so the Lord could build a tabernacle that we've been talking about the last month here. That was it. So they, God was going to bless them in order that they could take the blessings and then give it back to the Lord so they could be a part of what God was doing. But what really happens now for all these folks is they take God's blessings. All of these gold rings were all of God's blessings on them. And they say, all right, now let's go ahead and build an idol out of it. And we do the same thing because in America... We, the most obvious one is money. 
Let's just be honest. Like, I believe if you make like more than $30,000 a year, then you're going to be in the top 1% globally of richest people in the world. And I know it's hard right now, gas prices, but, but, but like we are a blessed people by and large, and God has given us those blessings here. But what happens to so many of us, we then take God's blessing, and then we say, all right, God, can you, can you scoot over a little bit, and I'm just going to put my pile of cash right there, right? Because we look forward into the economy, and we're like, oh, no, the stock market's about to crash, the housing market's about to go down. But if I got a, a big enough a nest egg here, then I'm going to be all right, Your nest egg is not going to protect you. God will protect you. And so we oftentimes get in this mode where we want to say, I still worship God. I'll still do, but but if he can just scoot over so I can have a little bit of a backup here as well in case God doesn't come through. Or sometimes, especially as talking about fathers and mothers today, like whenever we have children, what usually happens? All of a sudden now, all of our attention, all of our focus comes down to this little child, and we say, I'm going to make sure that this child only eats kale the rest of his life and, and for, involved in 14 you know, activities every single day, so they're going to be well vowed, and they're going to go to Yale someday, and they're going to do everything. And, and our whole entire life starts to get centered around this little child, and that will crush your child because you just put them in the spot that God should have been in. And they're never going to measure up to that because your whole life is centered around that child when it should have been centered around God. And so we take God's blessings, and those things are good things and blessings from God, but then we take them here and we say, God, can you you scoot over a little bit? (laughs) Because I need to put something else there as well. And that's what the Israelites were doing. They weren't saying, no, we want to reject God. They were just saying, can we have a little bit of a flavor from the rest of culture as well? And so in verse 6, it says, And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. Those were all offerings that Yahweh wants, the Lord wants. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, that, uh, that goddess the, of the calf was also a goddess of fertility. And so that word play um, is probably not monopoly, okay? Um, that, that play was more like orgies. It, it, was, it was debauchery here is what was going on, that that was going on here. And this is how quickly they've been, Moses has been gone for 40 days. And then look how far they have fallen. And so this story then now zooms out and it goes to Moses and the Lord talking. So they're still up on the mountain, verse seven now. It says, the Lord said to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have come corrupted themselves. And I love it because this whole entire time in the book of Exodus, every single time, the Lord is always saying, these are my people and I brought them out of Egypt until this verse. And then he's like, Moses, go get your people that you brought out of Egypt, right? It's the same thing that parents do. Like if my boy hits a home run, I'm like, that's my boy. If he like refuses to eat his broccoli and throws it, I'm like, babe, you need to talk to your son. <laughs> like we, we eat broccoli in my family. That's like your family. That's your mother-in-law. Like, like, right? like we, we throw that. That's what the Lord is doing right now. But it's justified because what had happened is that they just broke the covenant. The very covenant that they just made 40 days ago with the Lord They have now broken it. And he said, that covenant established that they were my people, and I was going to bless them. And they broke it, so they're no longer my people, Moses. You can go have them there. And so in verse 8, it says, they have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. It's like, Really? Really, that, that is the people, like the ones that you just made, now you're so convinced, you have lied to yourself so deeply that you have believed that lie, the idol, that they were the ones that brought them out. And so in verse 9, it says, the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. And I love this verse because even though down at the bottom of the mountain, they all thought God was distant. They all thought God wasn't paying attention, that God had forgotten about them, that Moses was not going to come back, that they were never going to hear from God essentially again here. What is really going on is the Lord says, I have seen these people. So when you feel like you are abandoned, when you feel like you are alone, when you feel like God is silent, that God is not going to give you the direction that you need to go, you can rest assured that God is still watching 
that God still cares, that God's still looking out after you here. But the goal is not to be a stiff-necked people. I mean, just stubborn people that refuse to turn there. And so in verse 10, it says, Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation of you. So it says, like, Moses, you're going to want to scoot out of the way, <laughs> is essentially what's happening here. And, and in our culture, we often want to think of God as loving, and that is 100% true, more than we can fathom or understand, yes. But at the same time, we need to understand that when we sin and go against God, he is also just. He is also just, and this is just as true for God. And so he's saying, no, 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 my people broke the covenant, and there needs to be a punishment for this covenant here. And then he turns over to Moses, and he's like, I'm going to make a great nation of you. He's like, you're Jewish, right? I can just start over with you, uh, is essentially what he's saying there. It's like, uh, forget about all, everything else. We'll just start fresh with Moses, so no longer sons of Abraham and sons of Moses had many sons, and many sons had Father Moses. And so... That is what he's saying here. I'll just start over here. But then Moses comes back with a response and a prayer. And this is so important, and it's worth paying close attention to because his prayer works. <laughs> and so if you feel like your prayers don't work, especially pay attention to how Moses prays. Because Moses says, but Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, Yahweh, why, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt in great power and with a mighty hand? Moses is still, I think, trying to wrap his mind around this. He does not say, cool down, God. He does not say the sin's not a big deal, but he's earnestly bringing, he's like, God, I need to understand this. Verse 12, it says, why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from your burning anger and relent from the disaster against your people. And so the very first thing that Moses does is he goes back to God's glory. He's saying, God, I know that you have your hand on Israel in order to show the rest of the world how good and wonderful you are, how glorious you are. So if you then go and you kill all of your people, what are the Egyptians? What is the rest of the world going to say about you, God? And he goes back and he falls back and says, God, I want your glory to be done. I want your will to be done here. And that's the same way for us. When we start to say, God, I'm not consumed about my own life. I'm not consumed about just all my wants, but I want your glory to be proclaimed. I guarantee you those prayers are going to be answered here. And so, and then in verse 13, he continues on even more so by saying, Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offsprings as the stars of the heaven. In all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. And then he goes back, and not only does he rely on God's glory, but he relies on God's word. He says, But God, you promised. You promised Abraham. Abraham, you promised Isaac, you promised Israel, which is Jacob. You promised them a great nation out of them, out of them. And so you have to be true to your word, God. And in the same way for us, we pray about all sorts of things, and that's a good thing. We should bring all those cares to the Lord. But at the same time, if we pray and we feel our feeling forsaken by God, his word says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we pray and we get down and we say, God, your word said you're never going to forsake me. He's going to answer that prayer. God says, I'll provide all your needs, not all your wants, but all your needs. And so when we start to pray, not for the wants, but for the needs, he's going to answer that. Why? Because his word has already promised that. So if you want to have your prayers answered, go back and actually pray his words back to him. And in verse 14, an interesting verse, it says, the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Some of the translations will actually say um, that he... Uh, that he turned around or, or that he actually um, uh, almost made a mistake, it sounds like. And we say, that, that's kind of weird, right? That, what is going on here? Well, number one, this is uh, anthropomorphic language, which is just a great word if you want to sound smart. <laughs> All right? So that's a free one. But what it means is that it's giving human emotions to something that is not human. God is so much bigger and grander than anything that we can comprehend here. And so for us, for us to represent or understand that God said, I'm going to destroy them, and then now I'm not going to destroy them, he had to put it in human language here. And that was a, a word that, that they found there. But even more than that, I want to just leave a couple truths in your hands, and you can reconcile it the way that you want it. God is 100% in control. He doesn't make mistakes. He's completely sovereign. He's completely, he doesn't say, oh, no, I really messed up that one. I got to change my, he's 100% in control. At the same time, he calls us to pray, and he answers our prayer. 
And we can, God, there's lots of theories. I got theories about how to reconcile that. But those truths are taught all throughout Scripture, that God is in control, but yet he wants us to pray, and he answers our prayer. And so continue to trust that God is not going to make a mistake. Continue to trust that it's all in God's hands, that we don't have to worry about it all, but then also get down on your knees and pray as if that prayer was the thing that had to convince God there. But notice, for Moses, he is the only one, so far at least, that did not fall into this idolatry. And what was the difference between Moses and all the rest of them down there? Moses was in the presence of God. And the next point in your bulletin is this, to be a man of God, to be a woman of God. You have to spend time with God. That was the only difference there. That was the reason why he did not fall is because he was down on his face in the presence of God. And we say, but yeah, they weren't allowed to come up the mountain, but you are. And that's wonderful news. There's nothing barring you from going in the throne room of God. We can spend time with God. And so if you are falling down to idols, if there's idols in your life, if there's addictions in your life that you have not been able to get to or get rid of, maybe it's because you're not spending the time with God that you should be. And so in the next verses, it says, verse 15, then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimonies, two iPads, I think, uh, just kidding, and, and his hands, tablets that were written on both sides. You no, know, it's like that was different than, than whatever's on the uh, TV screen usually. It's actually going to be written on both sides there. So it's, uh, he's saving money on the front and back copy, I guess. But on the front and back, they were written. It was actually all of Exodus 20 is very wordy. So there's actually, this would have been a probably a large tablet completely covered with words here. He is walking around here, walking down with his tablets, right? The tablets were the work of God and the writing was on the writing of God engraved on the tablets. These tablets here were the very finger of God wrote these things. These are highly valuable. These are highly important here. And it says, when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted. He said, Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. Just to remind you, Joshua was also halfway up the mountain. He was his assistant. And so he didn't get to go all the way up the mountain, but he was, he was not involved in that. So whenever Moses finally comes down and meets Joshua, Joshua's like, there's something going on down there. I don't know what it is, but there's noise. And he says, but he said, it is not the sound of shouting for victory or the sound of cry of defeat, but the sound of singing that I hear. He's like, it's, so, I, it's, it's not war, like it's war, but it's not victory. It's not defeat. It's just singing, I don't know what's going on. And so in verse 19, it says, as soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot, which is the exact same terminology that God had. So he then takes the tablets out of his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. That is serious. This was very serious. Don't worry, I already took my iPad out. <laughs> Some of you really freaked out, though, when I did that, <laughs> Think about what Moses just did. The very tablets written with the finger of God, he then takes it and he throws it on the ground and breaks it. And we say, Moses, like, calm down, man. You got to control that temper. What is going on here, Moses? But what was happening is Moses goes down and he sees all the people and they have already broken their covenant. And he's saying, what, what good is this covenant anymore? You have already broken it. So he takes and he breaks it as a symbol of showing, no, they have already broken it. I will now break the actual tablets here. In verse 20, he took the calf that they made and burned it with fire and ground it with powder and scattered it on the water and made the people of Israel drink it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Moses was never one to back down from a fight. Moses was never one to compromise, unlike Aaron, unlike almost every single other leader. Every time Moses is saying, no, I will fight for the Lord. I will do what is right here. And so he takes that, that calf that they just worked hard at, that they donated all their gold to, and he burns it down in front of all the people. Then he throws it in the water, and then he's like, here, drink it up. That calf got put in the water. They drank it, which, by the way, you might not know this, but this is the very first instance of a caffeinated drink. <laughs> yeah. Told you that wasn't going to be the only one. Thank you. Thank you. You know how he made it, right? He brewed it. <laughs> here all week. I'm here all week. 
No, Moses was here, and he was dedicated to say, I will do what God has called me to do. I will be the type of man that I don't care what the rest of the world is going to say. I don't care how many people hate me. I'm going to fight for the, what is very right here. And so the next point in your bulletin is this, fight for the right, fight for what is right. Some of you that were born in the 90s want to say, to party, right? Yeah. But fight for what is right. And I'll be honest, if I look around in our churches as a whole in America, I don't see very, men, very many men doing this. God has called us, called us men to be a warrior, to call us to be the fighters, to call us to stand firm. But so many of us get so distracted. And it's not like the men in our church are just going out or any church is going out and, and filling up idolatry, but rather we just get distracted by something else and we say, I'll serve God, but then I also want this, right? And I'm telling you, I'm begging you, please start to be a man that will fight for the things of God instead of staying up half the night playing video games when you're a grown man. Instead of going out on a boat, you never took your kids out there because you don't want them to mess it up. <laughs> Listen, we have a lot of men in our culture that know how to shave, <laughs> that drive big trucks, that know how to shoot. Those aren't men. Those are little boys that know how to shave. Because I know a lot of ladies with bigger trucks and a better shot than you anyway. <laughs> so do what only God has made you to do, which is to love your wife. Love your kids. Work hard at work every single day so you get home and you are exhausted and you are tired because you gave a God-glorifying effort to your work. And when you get home, if you need to say a prayer, say a prayer for strength. But then you go and you lay down on the ground and you play with your kids for a while. And then when you put them to bed, go and talk to your wife and invest in your wife. That is what a man of God looks like. That is something that only a man of God can do. And so it's time now to say, I'm not going to be distracted with all of this other stuff. There's nothing wrong with any of that in and of itself. There can be a time for that. But are you investing, investing in the things that God has put in your life to say, I'm going to fight for those things. I'm going to fight for my family. I'm going to fight for this church. I'm going to fight for my faith. I'm going to get rid of all these stupid, selfish addictions. I'm going to get rid of all of these things in my life. I'm going to look like the man that God has called me to be. That's what Moses was. That's what we're called to. In verse 21, it says, Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Moses is uh, kind of given the benefit of the doubt to Aaron and be like, they had to threaten you with a swirly or something like, what did they do to you? What did they do? Why, why would you give in like this? And Aaron does not have a good excuse because he says, and Aaron said, let the anger of the Lord, my Lord, not burn hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. This is almost the exact same answer that Adam gave whenever Eve sinned and he sinned. He's like, well, it's the woman you gave me. It wasn't my fault. No, no, no. A man of God takes control, takes ownership of when he was wrong and says it, right? And so he should have said, you know what? I was wrong and that was wrong. But he says, no, no, no. It's the, it's the people you gave me. In verse 23, for they said to me, make us, go make us gods who shall go before us. And as for Moses, this man who you brought up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And then verse 24, I love it so much. It says, so I said to them, let any of you who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> it's like... Aaron wasn't the smartest guy, it seems like, right? Like, that was the best excuse he could come up with in this moment. It's like, I threw it in, and poof. <laughs> like, one thing led to another. It's like, that, that does not, that's how not any of this works here. He's like a child. I, I, have, I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and there has been a renaissance in my house for uh, painting on the walls, <laughs> unfortunately. And they, they go around, and they're always painting on furniture and on the walls and all of this stuff. And uh, three or four weeks ago, there was a, uh, um, on a, one of our white doors, somebody took an upright orange marker and drew all over it about like three or four feet in the air. So somebody had to pull out a chair, stand up on the chair and draw on it. And I was so angry. All right. Just fully admit in here, my rage burned hot. And, um, and so I went to Mike. I knew it was him, my four-year-old. And I was like, Micah, did you paint on this door? And he's like, no. <laughs> I was like, who did it? And he was like, Levi. Now, Levi is my two-year-old. And at that time, 
if you remember, he was still in a full body cast <laughs> and, uh, and downstairs. And so I'm like, Micah, are you telling me that your two-year-old brother in a full body cast climbed up the stairs, <laughs> got a chair, got on top of the chair, and then painted? He's like, maybe, <laughs> like, right? That's the best excuse. That's the best excuse that Aaron could come up to with as well, because whenever you're caught in that sin, it often makes you dumb, and that is what was happening with Aaron. He's like, I don't, I don't have an excuse. And so in verse 25, it says, when Moses saw that the people had broken loose, for Aaron had let them break loose to the derision or mockery of the enemies, and then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. So Moses now, still fighting for the things of the Lord, goes out in front of the three million plus Israelites. And he says, who's ever on the Lord's side, come to me. And the sons of Levi, that means that one out of the 12 tribes stepped forward and said, we're on the Lord's side. After 40 days, 11 out of the 12 said, no, we're no longer on the Lord's side. Whether all of them participated or what, we don't know. But yet only one of them is going to step up and say, no, we are on God's side here. And so in verse 27, he said to them, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, put your sword on your side of each of you and go to and from, from gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. This is heartbreaking because now, if you don't know, the sons of Levi are going to be the priest, and this is how the priests start because they were the only ones that stayed faithful, and so Moses says, go get your sword, go to your brother, go to your son, go to every neighbor that you have that took part of this, and you kill him. That was what the type of commitment that it took to follow the Lord in the moment. And we say, how barbaric is that? But Jesus said as well, unless you hate your father and your mother, you cannot be a disciple of mine. That's not saying to hate, but it's saying that should be the level of love and devotion that you have for God outlasts everything else, every other relationship in this world. And so the final point in your bulletin is this. We're almost done. It says to count the cost to follow God. I guarantee you, all of those sons of Levi did not want to have to do that, did not want to take part in that, but yet God needed to show them that, no, whenever sin happens, when it has to be punished, he's a good and gracious, but he's also just, and he can't let this go on. And so in verse 28, it says, and the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. That's 9-11 type events in a much smaller nation. This would have been horrific. In verse 29, and Moses said, today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. This is how the priests got started. This is their ordination service. I'm thankful mine went a little different than this, because what it's saying is like, no, if you want to be a man of God, are you willing then to say God above everything else? And of course, we know God would never command us today to go out and kill somebody. But there's a lot of sin in your own heart that you've been letting sit there for a really long time. And now's the time to kill that, to be ruthless with it and say, no, I cannot continue to follow and say I follow after God and let all of this go on. Because this whole time I've been saying, God, I'll worship you on Sunday, but let me have Saturday night. I'll worship you then, but let me do what I want to do in all the other times here. And he's saying, no, that cannot be. In the last couple of verses, it says, The next day Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement or payment for your sin. Verse 31, So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now if you will forgive their sin. Notice, though, there's a dash there. And that dash is just going to indicate that it almost is like he started a sentence. And then he stopped it and went somewhere else with it. And I think I know why. Because he's saying, Lord, please forgive them of their sins. Please forgive them. But then in that moment, he realizes there cannot be any forgiveness without blood being spilled. And so at that moment, he switches and says, but if not, 
please blot me out of the book that you have written. I don't think that's talking about the land's book of life, but rather it's just a, a metaphor for who's alive, the, the history of the world here. And so he's saying, if you're going to kill somebody, if you're going to take somebody out, please let me stand in the gap. Please let me offer my life as a payment for all of their sins. Does that sound like somebody that you know? And so in verse 33, it says, but the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out my, of my book. But now, go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf the one that Aaron made. And we ask ourselves, why, why didn't? Why didn't he just take Moses' offering? Why couldn't he just, like he did with Jesus, like why, why couldn't he just take Moses' offering here? It's the reason is this, because Moses couldn't make that offering. He couldn't make that payment. See, he was human. He was sinful, not as sinful as the Israelites were, but, but in that moment. But yeah, he was still sinful, so he could not make that offering. But God knew there was somebody coming that was going to make an offering. There was somebody coming that was going to make the payment for those sins. And that person that was going to come was better than Abraham. He was better than Adam. He was better than Moses. He was better than Joshua. He's better than Isaac. He's better than Jacob. He's better than David. He's better than Solomon. He's better than all of them because one day Jesus Christ himself, the perfect sinless sacrifice, was going to come and he was going to make that offering. He was going to make that payment, and nobody else could except for Jesus. But what was happening was this. Numbers chapter 5, you can read more about it later, but whenever there was, a, whenever there was somebody that cheated on their spouse, a woman that was caught in adultery, what they would often do is they would make her go to the priest and drink a dirty, filthy drink. And if she was pure, if nothing, she didn't sin, then she could go away. Nothing bad happened. But if she was sinful there, that, that drink would actually give her horrific pain, it said. And it's a weird verse, but that was really the only way that they could determine how somebody was staying faithful or not. But when we come to Exodus, here's what's happening. God had just made this covenant, and it's just like a marriage covenant the whole way through. And he's saying now, I, I want you to be my people. Here's what it means. Here's the vows. Here's all the laws that this is what it means to be a child of God. This is what it means to be in a covenant in a marriage with me. And then while they're still on their honeymoon, Spouse goes and cheats on him. That is what, that's what this story is about. And he says, now Moses, go down, take that drink and make him drink it. Just like, just like the woman called God, you make him drink it and that plague is going to come. That plague is going to be on them. But here's the beautiful news. It's when we get over to the New Testament. Jesus, just like Moses, goes up a mountain, but this mountain was the Garden of Gethsemane on the night that he was about to be betrayed, literally, literally just a few hours away from when he was about ready to meet Judas with the kiss to get betrayed here. He is now sitting inside the garden, and he's praying on his hands and on his face, and there's literally blood coming out of sweat, and what does he say? God, take this cup from me, because he was about ready to take the cup that has your name on it has all of our names on it. And he was about ready to drink it up. And that cup is a symbol of God's wrath. And only Jesus could drink it. And he did drink it. And when it was poured out, there was nothing left for you and me. Because Jesus drank the wrath of God for you and for me. And so let's stop living a life that says, God, can you scoot over a little bit? Because I got something else that I'm working on as well. Let's say this is only and ever more will be only for the Lord. But here's the good news. You couldn't have made that payment yourself. In fact, you can't ever even be successful by yourself. Men, I, I know, 
I know so many men that feel broken, that feel unworthy, that feel, man, I wish life worked out differently. I wish I had other things. I wish I had a different family. I wish I had a different job. But none of that matters. None of that makes you successful. None of that makes you worthy. What makes you worthy is this, that God looked down and said, that is my son, and I am going to take that punishment that he deserves, and I will drink it myself because of my love for my child. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, Let me encourage you. To stop measuring yourself by any worldly standards, but to start measuring yourself by how God sees you. Men, women, young and old, it does not matter what your bank account says. It does not matter how good your son or daughter is at their sports or dance competition. It does not matter what the neighbors think of you. It matters what you do for God, and will you be faithful today? So if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I encourage you not to leave today without getting that settled, crying out to God. I'll be in the lobby as soon as this is done. I would love to talk to you about that. If you're, not, if you're unsure of what that means, what that looks like, I'd love to talk to you, not to embarrass you or put you on the spot, just to talk. For us believers in here, it's time to get those other things off the throne that only God deserves to be at. What is it? Is it money? Is it pornography? Is it your family? What is it? It's time to say, God, you alone have a place on the throne. Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you that you are a good father. We thank you that you care for us, that you have taken that cup for us when it should have been for us. It should have had our name on it, and yet you took it. Lord, I pray that we live in light of that and nothing else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and